Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gill, and thank you all for getting up so early. Um, uh, I'm, uh, it's traditional to thank the, um, um, the hard, okay. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this, but uh, Dr. Kaleos mentioned there was an extra session on interdisciplinary narrative. So I said, and I can get an extra paper. I say, why do I have to get an extra paper? Uh, I'll include it in my own presentation. So my presentation, all my presentations are interdisciplinary. I'm dealing with teaching, for example, teaching um, in the university or college. Uh, for example, using software in a course that happens in remedial math courses. That's prevalent there, but it happens in all courses. It happens in English. And my results apply to the disciplines of English and math. It happens in industry. You could be not using software. You could be using training slides. Um, you could be giving virtual practice to teach some new um, uh, industry method. Um, and it applies to alternate pedagogy. I've been hearing a lot at this conference, and it's a lot going on now, about apps and games to learn. Uh, I tried to make my presentation relevant, so I went in yesterday and picked on some unsuspecting uh, authors who do not know they are now in my presentation. So uh, let's go to this. It's the old approach versus the new approach to uh, teaching. So let me first give you what the old approach is. Uh, in the old approach, you asked if it worked. So there's a pre and post test. Um, there's a before and after. Uh, you might use a t-test on, on uh, sufficient uh, samples in the before and after. You publish a paper and say this worked, and you know then everyone says this works, let me use it. Uh, part of the problem with the old approach is aversion control mentality. If something's not present, you'll say, we'll do that in the next build, and you rely on the software. The software is good, you rely on it. Anything not there, it will happen later. Uh, that's for software. For presentation aids, there's a lot on the internet. I thought I'd mention the work of Marzano. So just to give the history here, um, in the 1950s, a person named Abraham Bloom uh, started uh, the whole analysis of pedagogical excellence. What he did is he gathered a team of psychologists and said, there's a hierarchy that starts at things like memorization and ends in things like creativity and analysis. And you're at a high level if you're doing the top six, and you're at the bottom level if you're doing the first two. And this caught on like wildfire, and everyone had to conform their teaching to the Bloom taxonomy. Now, 50 years later, several things happened. A student of Bloom, Anderson, revised his taxonomy. The revision basically used uh, verbs instead of nouns. But there was a person named Marzano, and he said, well, wait a minute. We have 50 years of research. We have people doing training in industry. We have people using software in, um, in teaching. So the issue became what works and what doesn't work. So Marzano came up with nine, his famous nine uh, pedagogical aids that work. They're over there because there are only nine. Uh, something is, something is going to aid in retention and learning if there are similarities and differences. Efferent, uh, emphasis on commonality, if there's summarizing, if there's recognition to people when they do the right thing, if there's homework and practice, non-linguistic, uh, cooperative learning, if objectives are clearly stated uh, with feedback, hypothesis testing, questions, cues, and other uh, things to open. So, if you go to a presentation where people ask all the time questions and cues, that'll be better than a presentation that doesn't. If you go to a presentation that summarizes or that has similarities and differences, that'll be better than one that doesn't. So this is the old approach, and of course it works, but I'm gonna give you a new approach where the basic idea is to concentrate on instruction versus software. 
So the basic idea is I'm not going to ask about the software. I'm going to ask about the instruction. My question is not does the software work. I don't care if the software works. I care is this software feature reflective of good instructional practice as embodied in the four pillars of good educational practice. I'll go into that in the next slide, and then the rest of the presentation will be examples. So let me just elaborate on this. The first thing I ask is not what software I will use, not what works. The first thing I will ask is how will I teach well? How will I instruct well? What are the principles of instructing well? Then when I decide how I'll teach, I'll say, is there some software out there that meets the features I want? Uh, and the point here is the emphasis is going to be on software, uh, and the emphasis is not going to be on, um, uh, the emphasis is going to be on instruction and not education. Okay. Let's first discuss the criteria for pedagogic excellence. This came from a book that was published uh, last year. Um, in fact, the authors used to come to this conference regularly, uh, Styron and Styron, uh, Leadership for Improving Success Through Higher Cognitive Instruction. I was a co-author, and this occurs in uh, one of the chapters, Comprehensive Problem Solving and Skill Development for Next Generation Leaders. In that chapter, I advocate four pillars of educational excellence. And this summarizes and replaces, and it's easier to use than Bloom, to learn Bloom or Anderson or even Marzano or Gagne or any of, or Von Hiley, any of the people who've been involved in education. You have to learn a classification system. Once you learn the classification system, for each classification, like, um, like uh, critical thinking, like uh, deep thinking, or like memorization. You have to learn a lot of synonyms, and then you have to learn how to, how to approach them in various situations. What I'm doing is going to be very easy to recognize. There's almost no work. You don't need training in it, and it's just as effective. So the four pillars are executive function, goal setting, attribution theory, and self-efficacy. So let me just briefly explain to you what each one is. Executive function is the portion of the brain that deals with multiple areas. So I'll give you a simple test that illustrates this. Uh, there's something called the trail making test. You have a piece of paper with 25 numbers and you're asked to make a trail. So you do one, two, three, four, up to 25. That's the A test. The B test has 12 letters and 13 numbers. And you're asked to do 1A, 2B, 3C, etc. until you use 1A, 2B, 3C, until you use up all 25. Now the B test always takes longer than the A test. And this test may appear simple, but it's used by neurologists. It assesses the possibility of, of stroke damage, of recovering from stroke and everything else, even though it's a simple test. And the reason the B test takes longer is because you're using two parts of your brain, the part of the brain dealing with numbers and the part of the brain dealing with number, letters. So there's a difference. If I say one, two, three, four, five, I'm using one part of my brain. If I'm saying one, A, two, B, three, C, even though I know the numbers and alphabet quite well, I am taking longer because my brain has to use its executive function capacity to, uh, to make that very simple list. So I don't need Bloom or Anderson or anyone to tell me about analysis or application or creativity. I just ask if there are two areas of the brain. As soon as you find two areas of the brain, no matter how simple, even if it's as simple as numbers and letters, which everyone knows, um, you have executive function and your pedagogy is higher. The next pillar is goal setting. Uh, there's a rich literature going back, going back to the 60s of the last century, really starting in the 90s, I imagine. Uh, basically, if you go into an industry setting or an educational setting, I think there's more literature on the industry. So we want productivity. And the issue is this. Why is it sometimes a group or people will produce more and sometimes they'll produce less? And one of the issues is, what types of goals are you setting? And there's literature on this. We'll get into some of the uh, literature later. But the point is, 
Goals have to be clear. They have to be clearly defined and measurable. They have to be achievable short time. And um, they have to be challenging. By the way, could I have Quieten back there? I mean, the, the, they announced yesterday the microphones are very sensitive, so um, I'd appreciate it. Uh, they have to be challenging. If you go to two employees and give one of them a simple task and another one a challenging task, the person with the challenging task will probably produce more than the person with the easy task. That sounds paradoxical because the person with the challenging task has more difficulty, and we refer to that as the paradox of goal setting, but that is what goal setting is. It's the way you set your goals. The third pillar is attribution theory. So this has to do, uh, and it applies a lot to school, it applies to business. You can ask a student, why are you doing well? What, you can ask an employee, why is he or she doing well? Now, you could say, because uh, I have the skills for this and I know how to do it. You can refer to the self. We call that internal attribution. Or you can say, because I happen to know the boss, I happen to know the teacher, or my family is very important, and that's attribution to an external source. So we have internal and external attribution. Uh, the other, th other dimension that's important in attribution theory is effort. Again, why did I do well on the test? I don't know. I was lucky. I didn't really study. Or what I do well on the test, what I get this promotion, well, the boss likes me. Um, so, uh, or because I've been putting a lot of effort into this project and they need someone like me to lead it. So what attribution theory has found is that when students and employees perceive, so it's perception, when they perceive um, their success as dependent upon their efforts, the emphasis being on what they do and on effort, they, uh, they will more likely to succeed than when, um, when it's perceived as being external. Uh, I saw a very nice illustration of this. Uh, the issue involved was how do you increase people getting mammograms? Okay, you're not training people to do that, but you want people to do that. And attribution theory explained there was three treatments, and they differed in one word. So the message a doctor could give, they could say, you know, when you have mammograms, when a person has mammograms, it, it, it helps in diagnosing breast cancer. And here the, the emphasis is on when one does it. The second treatment would say, when you get a mammogram, your doctor is more, uh, can help you, can, can see quickly if, if, if you need further treatment. So there the emphasis on the doctor. And the third treatment is when you get a mammogram, you can find out if you need further treatment. So the issue is who is being helped, the one in the world, the doctor or the person. So it's a very simple difference. They did this to three groups and the group to which internal self uh, motivation was given. You can determine it. Uh, they, of that group, the most people went for mammograms. So this is important material. There are lots of papers on all these things, but self and effort are important. The fourth pillar is self-efficacy. So just some background on that. Prior to 98, psychology was unconscious. Why did you do something? Well, you yourself don't know. It's because of unconscious desires, which you don't know about, and unconscious needs. So it's very hard to deal with the person then because you don't, yourself don't know what you're doing. Bandura came out in 98 with social cognitive psychology, uh, which he founded, and he said, no, people do better or people are motivated because of their internal social motivation. Now that sounds like something obvious, but it came out then, and a very important factor, the most important factor is self-efficacy. Do you believe that with your current set of skills, you could perform a, a certain task and, 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 and successfully complete it? That's called self-efficacy, and independent of whether you have the skill, that it determines whether you'll succeed or not and there are ways of raising that self-efficacy. So I'm now gonna go through the four examples 
And um, I'm going to show in each one how their software, the software does not work because it works. It works because of good instructional technology. So for those who are coming in late, we were discussing beforehand, not everyone was here. So I'm going to repeat my theme four times. So if you came in late and wondered what you missed, uh, this screen is important. And the idea that focusing on pedagogy instead of focusing on software, we will see in four examples. OK. So actual exam practice software. So I'm going to speak about this later today. But um, let me just speak about uh, curriculum in general. Black and William, in, a, in the late 90s, published a paper, a meta-study of 250 papers. So this wasn't one paper. They went and looked at the literature, and they found dozens and dozens of papers. And two things, SC and SLO. SLO is specific learning objectives, and SC is structured curriculum. If a curriculum was structured, and I'll go into that in a minute, and if it had specific learning objectives, the average grade rise, the average grade was like half a letter more. So um, these are important instructionally. What I'm going to do now is explain what SC and SLO are, then I'll relate it to the four pillars, because as I said, you don't need all these papers, you just have to see if something belongs to the four pillars. And um, that will be that example, and that is, and then I'll show you why software that helps with uh, these features is going to be good. First of all, what's structured curriculum? Structured curriculum basically means a hierarchy. So I took an example from the theory of interest, which is part of the actuarial curriculum. You don't have to know anything technical. You all know what a loan is. So there's a unit in the course that deals with loans. There's a unit in the course that deals with bonds. You all know what bonds are. There's a unit in the course that deals with annuities. People, when they retire, sometimes take an annuity. And then the annuity module has sub-modules. One module might be level annuities, where the payments you get are level. Another sub-module might be increasing annuities. You get so much this year, so much more next year. The increasing annuities can be inflation uh, uh, adjusted. So I get so much this year, and next year I get 2 or 3% more because the cost of living is going up. That's an example of increasing an annuity. Then there are decreasing annuities, um, and there are various other types of annuities. The point is, when I start speaking about level annuities, increasing annuities, decreasing annuities, I'm speaking about a very specific topic. I'm not speaking about a general topic. And that's uh, an example of specific learning objectives and structured curriculum. The curriculum is organized in a hierarchical manner, and it contains very specific objectives and, and that, that is the basis for the instruction each day. And when that happens, the average grade is half a letter higher, and of course students are happier and they learn better. Okay, let's look at what I just spoke about, hierarchical curriculum and specificity. Hierarchy uses executive function. There's a top layer and a bottom layer, so two parts of the brain are being involved. When I look at um, I look at something in the interest theory module, I'm thinking of the supercategory of interest, I'm thinking of the subcategory of annuities, and then the sub-subcategory of, um, of particular types of annuities. And, and this is important. Uh, specific learning objectives deals with specificity and clarity. So specificity and clarity deal with the goal setting uh, um, that I mentioned, it's one of the four pillars. And again, goal setting deals with something that's achievable short time, uh, specific and challenging. So just to give you an example, if I walk into a room and say I'm gonna cover annuities today, I haven't been specific. I've given a very vague uh, goal. You'll say, well, annuities is technical, uh, but that means it's vague to you also. If I go into a room and say, I am dealing today with inflation-adjusted annuities, so they'll pay you $1,000 a, a month the first month in the first year, and the next year they'll pay you uh, $1,020 because of inflation. I've just, even though you don't know anything about the technicalities, I've just given you a very specific and clear objective. 
and I'm going to say, I'm going to teach you today how to price such an annuity. Well, that's something specific. And I'm going to show you the formula or method. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to show you the problems that are, that, that are involved. And that is an example of something achievable short time. So the goal setting is present when you have specific, specific learning objective and structured curriculum. And um, therefore, software is good because instruction is good. I don't need further testing. Does my software have specific modules? And does my software have structured curriculum? So let me give some further examples on this. The software is only good if you teach using structured curriculum and specific learning objectives. So you'll have studies, well, this software worked for this person, this software did not work for that person. And the study will not have the added variable of what instruction method did they use. If I use the best software in the world, but I'm a lousy teacher, if I don't use the four pillars, it's not going to help anyone because my instruction is bad. The instruction, on the other hand, if I'm a good instructor, I don't need the software. The software may help me, and I'll show you how. So in, instruction, not software, is the major driver. Uh, and I, I'll give an example on the next slide. I had some software where the solutions were mechanical. They had long lines of algebra, and at the end, the solution came up. Now, that's not a way to teach math. Maybe it was the way you've learned math, but it's not the way to teach math. Deborah U. Halle came out with what's known as the rule of four. The rule of four says that everything you teach in mathematics should have a formula, it should have a picture, geometry, it should have a computation, and should have some verbal component. Those are the four things. So I wasn't going to say, well, the software doesn't have it. I'll wait for the next build. Instead, what I did is I'll say this software can help me in one part of my instruction. and in the other part of my instruction, I'm going to supplement the software. And if they come around to giving me this, you know, I'll use it. But in the meantime, I'm going to be uh, instructing my students well. So uh, I just mentioned this. Executive function is the rule of four, because this involves four parts of the brain. Uh, for example, what is a maxima? Well, uh, you can see a maxima. Uh, if you look at a U, the bottom of the U is the minima. That's geometric. If I show you a table, the minima is the smallest number. That's computational. Um, and, and if I use the first derivative test, that is something formal and algebraic. I'm using three areas of the mind. And Deborah U. Halle's revolutionized calculus by introducing this. Uh, the software did not have the rule of four and the solutions. They would have 10 lines of algebra. I go to my class, maybe have three lines of algebra, a picture, and, some comp and two lines of computation. But the point is, all areas of the brain were being uh, used. And uh, so I, I wasn't in the slide, but I'll mention it. Um, so the software I'm using, and I'm speaking about that tonight, so I try not to overlap the two lectures. Um, it has 1,500 problems, but the 1,500 problems are organized in a structured curriculum with specific learning objectives. Supposing I'm a student and I just heard my lecture on inflation-adjusted annuities. Well, I go to the software curriculum, I go to annuities, and I go to, um, I go to, I, I go to inflation-adjusted geometric annuities, and I get problems on that particular topic. That's what I mean the software is helping me instruct. It is mirroring the, the structure curriculum and specific learning objectives. So that's our first example. The second example, um, I just went through uh, Marzano's nine uh, items. And uh, I was going to spend more time on this. I see I spent more time on the annuities, which is fine. I want to spend time on the lecture I heard yesterday here. So I'll just go through this. Marzano says to use tables, similarities, and differences. Well, that's two-dimensional. That's executive function. He said to summarize, so you have a basic hierarchical idea and then examples. Like in this lecture, I said uh, instruction versus software, and then I gave four examples. That's executive function. There are two layers. Recognition, recognizing students, that's attribution theory. That's saying you made a nice effort, you did it yourself, and you should be recognized. Practice. Now, everyone knows about practice. Sometimes it's a dirty word. But practice uh, leads to success and performance. Success and performance is the highest driver of self-efficacy. 
Non-linguistic is pictures, that's executive function. Feedback, um, that's goal setting. I go into dart throwing experiments, but all I can say is they found when you set goals, if you have feedback, you'll get better results. Questions and cues, that is called open-ended executive function. Uh, hypothesis testing, well, you're dealing with two possibilities. I couldn't find anything for cooperative learning, though, of course, I believe in it, but I just want to show you the Marzano instructional aids all mirror the four pillars. Now, example three was from this conference. It was a lecture by P. Yu Lian and Kate Zhu Xing from Taiwan. Digital game-based learning for EFL learners. They do not know I included this in my presentation. Students' acceptance and perceptions of vocabulary learning assisted by mobile game applications. And their, their talk was, um, can mobile games help improve vocabulary? The answer was yes. And she explained what the software was like. There's a reviewing function, a well-structured uh, game and thematic vocabulary da database. So let me go over these things. Reviewing function simply means the game will tell you if you're doing well. Well, that's feedback. And that's a major success factor in goal setting. And I mentioned the dart throwing experiments. I won't go into them now. That will take me a little bit of a while. But part of goal setting is giving an employee or student feedback. You did this right. You did this wrong. Improve this. Don't improve that. And things like that. Uh, structured design. So I asked her, what does that mean? She said, well, there's a beginning level, a medium level, and a higher level. Challenge is part of goal setting. And goal setting is a major pillar. Employees and students do well when you give them a challenging task that is not easy. And uh, that's true, by the way, in the, um, in the actuarial software, there are 10 levels of difficulty. Uh, um, a major approach to goal setting, I've already mentioned this, it should be well-defined, challenging, and achievable short time. And the software, again, the actual software has 10 levels of difficulty. And again, this is only successful if it's part of the instruction. I'll go into a classroom at the beginning and say, I'm going to give you easy problems today because you saw this for the first time. Then after a few weeks, I say, OK, you've seen the easy problems. I'm now going to give you challenging problems on the level of the SOA exam that you hope to pass soon. Uh, thematic vocabulary database, I said, what is that all about? She said, well, the game gives hints. If the answer, a answer is zebra, they'll say animal. If the answer is um, rose, they'll, the hint will be plant. So this is using the hyponym, hypernym concept. Uh, just to refresh your memory, the hyponym, hypernym, that's a category like plants. And then the examples, hyponyms and hypernyms, like roses, lilies, etc. The emphasis on two layers is executive function. And uh, good, this is the last slide. Uh, attribution theory. So I just mentioned this is very important. Students and employees must perceive that they are succeeding because of their own internal, F, uh, their own internal um, uh, activities and those activities deal with effort. Uh, if they think it's due to luck or some external factor, they are not motivated to learn and their actual performance will be less. And that's the old idea that Ordering someone to do better will not make them do better. So all the software, the word games, the math, and the English, there was an emphasis. The emphasis is on their being objective. If a software says, I didn't do a problem, it's not because the teacher doesn't like me or they use something subjective. The machine is grading it. That means it's objective. This has nothing to do with luck. It has to do with whether I know the material or not. Uh, attribution theory says self plus effort is best, and it's contrast to who you know and luck. And I just thought I'd close. So I put this at the end in case I didn't have enough time, but I do, I, I, I'm running out of time, so I'll just mention, you might think this, not, this does not apply to essay writing. In essay writing, why'd, I, why'd you get an A? Well, the teacher really liked my style. That's very poor. That student will not do well. Jones and Faulkner, and they wrote uh, a book on college writing, and their book emphasizing, emphasizes skills and efforts. There are five ways of linking two sentences together. Once you have sentences uh, developed, there are four ways of making paragraphs, and then there are ways of making essays. So they have a collection of skills. If you follow those skills, you'll do well in writing, and if not, not. I don't know if anyone put it into software, 
but the exercises are the equivalent of software in that you can practice. So this basically is the end of my presentation. So first of all, I want to thank you for um, listening. There'll be a question and answer session later for those who came in late. I see quite a few. Again, my theme was that you have to worry about instruction, instruction of the four pillars, and um, uh, not the software. The software is good only if it helps you in the instruction. Thank you very much. Thank you.